Good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming to listen to this little talk about the future of work. Um, my job, if, it, if I'm successful today, is to try and convince you that we have to start talking about the future of work. And we have to do this in schools and in the workplace um, and just about everywhere else. I also want to leave you with uh, a thought that we're in the midst of a digital revolution, uh, unlike anything we've ever seen before. And this has already changed the way we work today and uh, what the future of work will look like. And I hope I'll also leave you with the impression that it's all going to be OK. This story uh, came to me uh, really from youth. Uh, started with my niece and nephew, and then questions from coworkers, peers, everyone. Uh, they started to ask the same question over and over. And uh, when you start to have all of these questions come to you, you start to ask a bunch of questions yourself. What happened for me was I started to ask, why is everybody so confused about the future of work? Is the future of work different for them than it would be for me? Should I start worrying about the future of work? And then the really important question that I asked was, why are you asking me about the future of work? And that was a, a trend that I started to realize there was a pattern for. You see, I spend my time at the intersection of people, technology, and innovation. And in general, I talk to people about the future. I share future thoughts and uh, predict what I think is going to be happening with the future. And to my surprise, not a lot of people were talking about it. Nobody was talking about the future. And so I started to read everything I could. What's happening? Where's happening with the future of work? What, what's happening in the way technology is perceived? Um, why are people concerned? What are the global demographics that take place? Everything. And this is a sort of a snapshot of that story. To put your head in the right place to understand where we're at, imagine yourself at the convergence of many, many tracks, like you just see on the screen. And on those tracks, there are trains coming at you full speed. And we're going to do everything in our power to try and stop them. But each train is a trend. And the best thing you can do is either get on board or get out of the way. Here's the first train. Maybe not. About 197 million people are unemployed in the world as of 2012. This is down a little bit from a peak in 2009 when it was about 212 um, million people. But the real number that's a concern here is that the real number that's a concern here is that the underemployment is a big issue. That is actually probably double the amount that you're seeing on the screen. But for youth, this is even a bigger problem. 74.2 million people who are youth are actually defined as between 15 and 24 years old are unemployed in the world. And again, their underemployment in youth is very high. And so what you see in some countries, like you take a look at Spain, that can represent 50% of their population unemployed. Big problem. The digital train, the technology train, is continuing down its track. Nothing's stopping it. It's moving at high speed. Faster, cheaper, uh, nano, robotic, every awe-inspiring technology you can imagine that we just simply take for granted. We're in the midst of this digital revolution. It's changed the way we think, the way we act, the way we connect, and it's changed the way we work, and it'll change our work forever. One of those technologies is more ubiquitous than any other, and it's the mobile phone. Estimates suggest that there are 6.8 billion mobile phone subscribers in the world. To put that in context, that's almost 98% of the world's population. We're all getting connected. This is unheard of. And uh, what you're seeing here is that the phone, and the mobile phone in particular, is right up there with food and water and shelter as a basic necessity. So what you can argue is that connection is a basic necessity. People are being empowered everywhere. We can do everything we want, and we don't even have to leave home. People can gather a team, pull that team together with every imaginable skill, 
bring them together in a virtual way and perform any task you've asked. We can crowdsource any activity we want to be able to do. People are now empowered to do everything. We've seen this uh, with Arab Spring, uh, any kind of political change, and everything you can imagine is going on in the world. And there are more people willing and able to work. Right now, the numbers are that about 4.6 billion people on the planet, or about two-thirds of the population, is of working age. So if you felt that you were having a little trouble getting your resume out there and uh, competing, imagine what it's like competing with 4.6 billion people. And that's the kind of state we're in right now. There's people leaving the workforce too. This is kind of an interesting trend. About 300,000 people a month right now are turning 65 in the world. About two thirds of those people actually retire, and I know there's some millennials sitting out here, they're saying, I wish they would retire a little quicker. <laughs> um, but the truth is, that's actually a double engine train. There's a bit of a problem there. As baby boomers pull out, they pull out their income, they pull out their tax base, and they pull out their deep knowledge and domain skills at the same time. And this is not a, a stable situation for some organizations, for some countries. So we have to start to think about that in a different way as well. This old rusty bolt here is designed to make you think about the legacy work, the work that used to be of the previous generation. Your grandfather's job, your father's job, have changed so dramatically that they're unrecognizable. In some cases, they may have been eliminated altogether. And the point here is that you can't look at the history of work and use it as a lens to look at the future of work. That's a big problem. Oh, and yeah, if you haven't really noticed, we've got a bunch of environmental issues in hand. Water management problems, food management problems, uh, anything you can think of. And some of these environmental problems are actually threatening our existence, let alone where we're gonna work. These are big issues. And just to kind of kick us while we're down, there's a lot of people getting pretty agitated about the global distribution of wealth. About 20% of the population control the majority of the wealth in the world. And it's actually less than 20%, but most people understand that it's not because 20% of the work of the world works harder than we do. It's that there's something amiss, and that balance has got to be changed. And this is creating a problem for the mi minority in this situation and the majority. So, shake it out a little bit. That was, I know, some dark stuff. But let's understand now you're sitting at this track and you're in the happy place. Don't worry, be happy. There's a great opportunity in front of you. With every revolution that has come through history of time, what we've seen is that there has been incredible opportunity at the beginning, during, and at the end of that revolution. And there's no reason why we're not going to be seeing unbelievable opportunity right now. You, you people, and me, I suppose, have been given many gifts. Think of them. Let's just say the internet, uh, global free trade, cheaper, faster technology that can do almost anything you want it to do, a global community of work, and no end of problems that need solving. This is more than all the baby boomers started with, and you got all of that to use and play with and go forward. So. There are new jobs coming, and we have to change and think about the future of work in a different way. Let's imagine for a second that we're the energy sector. What did the energy sector do when supply was not there for the demand? What did they do? Well, they started to dig more holes. They started to use analytics and predictive models to figure out where the opportunity would be and try to coordinate that. They started to develop alternatives. And in general, they started to apply science to the problem. And we're gonna to have to do the same thing with the future of work. We're gonna to have to apply science to that problem. To understand the future of work, you have to understand three trajectories. The first is what you know today, what you passionately wanna change, and what needs to be changed. And when you can understand those intersection points, the future of work will be revealed for you. 
we're going to have to get a new resume. I talked about the 4.6 billion people out there competing with you. Do you think that passing around a paper-based resume with your description of your work is going to make it? I don't think so. We're going to need a picture of you. This is you. This is the opportunity. And we have to see what the match is. And once we can understand what the match is, we can see where the gaps are. And once we understand the gaps, then we can make that happen uh, and see where the opportunity is for you. And so we're going to have to do that for that colossal amount of people around the world. You're going to have to learn all the time, not just take a degree, maybe go out and get a job. It's learning constantly, constantly reinventing yourself and the organizations you work for. You're also, you're also going to have to uh, think like a serial entrepreneur. Many, many jobs, many, many organizations, not one job and one organization for your entire career. In general, what you have to understand here is that the job descriptions of the future have not been written yet, and all of us have to write those job descriptions. And that is what the challenge is going to be going forward. So the future of work is already here. It's already upon us. And if you don't believe me, I uh, invite you to read a book called The Shift. Uh, the Future of Work is Already Here. It was written by a woman by the name of Linda Gratton. And uh, it's an, a compelling read, and it's right on point. In addition, at the Center for Digital Media this year, we're going to start to talk about and teach the future of work. And that may be the first time that's ever happened. But in addition, I draw a lot of these conclusions from where I work. And all of the themes and all of the ideas and all of the trends I've actually just described to you are playing out for me every day in my work at IBM. And it's there that I learned this really fundamental thought. If you want to be good about predicting the future, you have to make it yourself. And so I leave you with this. Make the future of work your own. Take it on. It's yours. I leave it in your hands. Thank you very much.